What in the wild, wild world of sports do we have here? It seems to have the Toyota symbol, but I'm not familiar with this model. Is it a Camry? Oh, no. No way, man. Is it like an enormous Yaris? No. It's not one of them either. Okay, how about an Avalon? No, they don't make those anymore. This, ladies and gentlemen, is Toyota's latest sedan, and it is a flagship. Would you like to take a sail in it? Stick with us. is a wheelbase, two available hybrid power plants, and a certain Lexus-like build quality. This is what, uh, this is what Toyota's brought us. The, uh, the name is Crown, and it's been around for a long time in the domestic market in Japan. But we haven't had a lot of these here. <laughs> And this one is all new to the U.S. market, and it's quite an interesting car. I see a lot of scuttlebutt discussion that what in the world is this car for? Why in the world is Toyota building this? We already have the Camry. And Well, you see, these are uh, people that don't seem to know a whole lot about what's going on here. What's going on here is Toyota's decided to grace the U.S. market with their, uh, their top-of-the-line sedan. They've taken all the things that they've learned about how to make a sedan, including very sophisticated all-wheel drive hybrid power plants, and put it in one package that is designed to, I think more than anything else, this is designed to show you what a Toyota can be in terms of it has everything you need and most of the stuff you'd want, and yet is not the price of a Lexus. But it really does have that kind of persona to it. And it, I, I think more than anything else, it has this feeling of build quality that as good as a Camry is, and as good as an Avalon was, this is a, it's like a little bit of a step above. And it also has some things that you won't get on these other vehicles, including these all new power plants. This particular one is a limited version and it comes with a 2.5 liter hybrid engine. Now, what does this mean? Well, it's very similar to the uh, 2.5 liter that comes in a lot of other Toyota products, such as the RAV4 hybrid is a 2.5 liter with an electric motor and an electric motor that drives the rear wheel. So that would be, uh, let's see, let me cipher it. That's two electric motors. Uh, but it's different. Uh, it is a latest generation. It even uses a different oil, which uh, I'll get into more later because I'm fascinated by the whole oil thing. But uh, a lot of people, they, they very quietly kind of introduced this into the American market, not making a big deal about it. But I haven't driven it now and haven't started to peek into its insides. I think it's a very big deal because it's not only a really great car, just the way it is right now, I think it's also a harbinger of what's to come from Toyota. This is very similar in some ways to the uh, all-electric XBZ4, whatever, 4X, whatever the heck it was, which we've, uh, I don't know if I've run that video for you yet, but I will. Uh, no, I think I have. Yeah, it's there, look, look for it. <laughs> It reminds me, this car reminds me a little bit of it as in the, uh, the all-electric sedan from Toyota and their only fully electric vehicle they're selling in the United States right now. It's kind of similar to this in terms of this level of build quality. This is a much more practical vehicle in my view though and has uh, that wonderful uh, hybrid attributes of getting uh, uh, MPGs around in the 40s and a range of four or 500 miles, I can't remember which. 
but it has all these great things in a package that is oh so comfortable and easy to understand. It also has Toyota Safety Sense 3, which is their latest version of uh, semi-autonomous driving and all that kind of stuff that I like and don't like. But we'll get uh, to that in a little bit, but first let's look under the hood and see what we have that uses some very strange oil. Mm-hmm. Ah, uh, what lies beneath the crown? Well, I guess I should say what's, what lies inside the crown. But anyway, this is a uh, the Crown uh, Limited's power plant, which is also on the base model. Uh, and the it's the, there is one other trim level higher than this, which is the Platinum. And the Platinum comes with a hybrid max power train, which adds turbocharging basically to this powertrain. And this powertrain consists of a 2.5 liter inline four uh, engine uh, supplemented by not one but two electric motors. One in the front right in this area here that you can see fr from the hood anyway and uh, one at the back that drives the back wheels. Uh, this particular engine and there it is right down there look at that 0 W8 oil. Wow. To the best of my knowledge, and I'm asking Toyota, waiting for an answer, I think it's the only vehicle they make that has that designation for what oil they want in it. Incidentally, the hybrid max version of this car on the Platinum, it's a 0 20 weight oil, so go figure. But uh, this particular engine puts out 184 horsepower at 6,000 RPM and 163 pounds of feet at 3,600 RPM to 5,200 RPM. So a nice wide spread of torque. Uh, and then this is supplemented and ad added to by the electric motor, which uh, the front one, there's two of them, like I said, this one puts out 88 kilowatts of power, which is 149 foot pounds of torque. And then the rear one, right over the rear, right under, right next to, right part of the rear wheels is uh, 40 kilowatts and 89 pounds of feet in terms of torque. And all of this together uh, combines for 236 horsepower total output. Neat, so, and, and another interesting thing about this car, everybody's been going to uh, lithium ion batteries, including Toyota, but on some of their latest models, they are still using nickel metal hydride batteries. I say still because it's a latest version, because uh, just like with lithium ion batteries, many improvements are being made all the time to the uh, nickel metal hydrides. But I like them because I find them more stable. They last forever, at least they have on Toyota hybrids. And uh, they also don't have a lot of the issues that lithium ion batteries have. The only down part is, downside of it is they're a little bit heavier per specific out power output compared to lithium ion, but that's it. I mean, otherwise, they got a lot going for them, especially in the application of using them in the car, which Toyota's been doing for, uh, what, 20-something years now? More than that? 24 years, I believe. Anyhow, if we take a tour here, we see, uh, we see our little air box right over here. And this is a sensor telling you what's going into the air box, I reckon. <laughs> and this then goes into the, uh, directly into the plastic or polymer uh, intake manifold right here, which feeds into one, two, three, four, your four cylinder engine. Very, very straightforward, very simple. Here's your old dipstick. There's where you fill her up. And here, very similar to the Lexus uh, RX500H I had recently. Very, very elaborate system of engine stabilization to help reduce vibration. And it does very, very well, actually. And you can see all the belts. <laughs> I kid, I kid the belts. There are no belts on these hybrids, which is fantastic. You never have to worry about replacing your belts or having one break on you, because there are none. It's all done via electric motors here and there, including the water pumps, because there is a, a coolant system for the battery system and a coolant system for the uh, internal combustion engine. So, 
It looks complicated, but it isn't that bad. And uh, if you were here with me in person, you could tell that there's actually a fair amount of room around this engine. It's not totally crammed in here like so many others. And one of the most interesting things about the Crown is there's no other Toyota that's quite this size. I don't know how to describe it. It's, it's a mid-sized car, basically, but it seems to have a little bit more room than that. Uh, but the exterior, like I said, it's a 112-inch wheelbase. The exterior of the vehicle uh, is, is fairly compact and easy to park. I mean, it's a real nice size. It's like they considered for a long time exactly how big they wanted to make this thing uh, before it went into production. And again, I, I'm not sure why, maybe this will change, but I think they need to promote this, uh, this car more because I think it's terrific so far. I mean, it's just a, it just has a cut above it. It's, if you could slot it in just below Lexus and, and above Toyota, that's where it would go. Uh, as Toyota's flagship, it's not surprising because uh, it's not cheap either. And they have clearly been interested in putting a very, very top quality machine at your fingertips uh, and fill out the Toyota line with it. And I think it's a great idea, actually. A lot of people think it's, it's redundant or whatever. And who cares what those people think? They know nothing. Nothing. The only interesting thing that, that could be a problem at the moment is this uh, 0 w 8 oil because I don't know where you get that <laughs> other than the dealer. I think you got to get your oil from the dealer if you're the kind of person that's going on long road trips and wants to carry a quart of oil with you just in case. But if you regularly service this vehicle, uh, which is oil change, they say I believe 10,000 miles, but you should really have it done every five, uh, you're not going to have problems with oil being starved out and you're going to have to add in between oil changes. Very unlikely, but you can go buy a quart and stick it in the trunk somewhere and have it just in case you need it. But just understand at this stage in the game here in uh, nearly August of 2023, it's a very uncommon oil type. And could you put 016 in here? I'm sure you probably could without problem. But uh, could you put 020? I don't know. But then again, like I said, the turbocharged version, the 2.4 liter uh, version of this general family of engines that's on the hybrid max takes 020 oil. So confusing, but I think we may be looking at the optimization of fuel economy because, and they have just found with this particular grade of oil, that's where they got their maximum fuel economy and the engine is more than capable of being uh, adequately lubricated buy this thin oil and I mean it's going it must look like water zero eight never even seen it before but there you go beautiful car and lots of electric power uh, at, at the beck and call there both this motor down in here mm -hmm, and the one that you'll see later that drives the rear wheels very sophisticated and it's all part of the royalty that is the Toyota Crown well, well, we have your tires here and your rather substantial wheels, including, uh, well, first of all, the tire size is uh, 225, hang on, 225, 45, R21, so 21 inch wheels. Wow, that's big. But they do have a little bit of meat on these tires. These are Bridgestone Terranza something, uh, EL450s, you see. That's your 450s. Uh, but that's a, quite a, sa a sizable wheel. It also has sizable brakes and sizable brake calipers. And this is all also part, not of just of braking, but of the regeneration of electrical power for the battery, as you know. And so we have the front motor that does that. And we'll go back here. Nice lines, beautiful paint. Uh, Back here behind this wheel here is your, uh, your motor for the rear wheels and it also contributes to uh, regeneration of power to the battery when you're coasting or where you, when you're braking, either one. And just looking from here, we'll look in depth later, but looking from here I see a suspension that has elements of the RAV4 hybrid in the RAV4. It just, it reminds me of that. It probably has nothing in common with it, probably doesn't share a single part, but however, I look at it and I think of these things. 
Um, but that's, you know, that's me. And I'm a very confused individual. Now let's open up this trunk here. It does not have power actuation, but it, uh, it weighs nothing. It may be aluminum. It doesn't weigh anything. I mean, it's nice. And the trunk area is quite huge, uh, especially if we're going to call this a midsize. And as you can see, as we move up in here, you got a full access to the rear area of the car for extended length cargo, thanks to your uh, 6040 seat backs at 404. Not all, you don't always see that on hybrids, but the uh, hybrid battery is underneath the rear seat. And incidentally, uh, on most of the hybrids, Toyota hybrids, there is a ventilation system that's on, that's where the battery is, which is on, which is underneath the pedestal that the seat sits on. And on most of the Toyota hybrids, there's a ventilation duct that you need to keep clean. If you have a lot of dogs in the car, it, it, it can get clogged up with dog hair and stuff. But it's on the right side, the passenger side. But on this particular vehicle, that particular vent is on the driver's side, left side. Why? I don't know, but it is. Now, what do we have here? Let's check this out. I'm gonna uh, move move my displacement here. Ugh, lift, there we go. <gasps> Look at there, a very nice temporary spare tire. And is that, do my eyes deceive me? Or is that one of my favorite things on some of these hybrids? An aluminum scissor jack. So if you have a flat tire, you not only have a nice spare to put on it, temporary but substantial uh you got a nice aluminum jack to ease your mind and back <laughs> because they weigh so much uh they weigh dramatically less than the steel counterparts let me tell you personal experience i love those aluminum jacks what's here <gasps> there's your 12 volt nice big 12 volt battery what's the 12 volt on a hybrid when you got that huge hybrid battery Runs all the computers. It's the battery that, and also usually runs the uh, motors for the windows, things like that. But more than anything else, it powers up the computers when you first start it. And everything else is dependent upon those computers. So that, uh, your 12 volt battery is very important. And it lasts just like most 12 volt. If you get the original Toyota batteries, I've re regularly gotten like seven years out of them. Uh, but it varies. Your mileage may vary, but it's very important that you remember that you do in fact have a 12 volt battery and It's very critical to starting the vehicle. Can you jump that 12 volt battery? Yeah, you can uh, the, You have to follow specific instructions But you absolutely can And look here. Do we have the standard twin exhaust on these things? It is so prevalent among all the uh, dynamic force and non-dynamic force in line. Four cylinders of roughly quarter, le uh, quarter liter display, or not quarter liter. What am I thinking about? Anyway, 2.5 liter displacement. Uh, yeah, I don't see them. I do not see them. But I bet they're there. Oh, there's one. And there's the other. Yeah, they hit them away. That's why the car looks so much like a full electric. Uh, but it does have that nice little dual exhaust that all those engines have. And uh, there you go. Bob's your uncle and uh, Louise is your, your, your aunt. How's that? But man, this does not look like any other uh, Toyota. It doesn't look like a Camry. It doesn't look like an Avalon. It looks almost like it would have a hatchback on it, but it's, it's not one of them hatchbacks. It's, we have all these cars out there that look like they're sedans and have a regular trunk that are actually hatchbacks. And this is vice versa. Looks like it could be a hatchback, but it just has a normal trunk. And very, very generous trunk room, as you saw. Uneasy lies the crown. Actually, that's not true. It actually, uh, it lies quite comfortably and what is also comfortable is not only the interior itself, but in general, the uh, control interfaces and everything on this car are very, uh, I would say, basically familiar and straightforward. Not quite as crazy as so much of the modern stuff we see now. Uh, if you say, if you, you have, we have a green glow here because we're in the forest, just so you know. Um, but here in our uh, flat screen instrument display with its 
semi-analog type looking instrumentation. Uh, as is <clears throat> typical hybrid practice these days, we have no tachometer, but what we do have is an energy meter on the left. And as you can see in the lower quadrant right in here, that's when you're charging, which means you're either coasting or braking, usually. Uh, <clears throat> although some charging does take place as, as the engine decides to charge the battery because the battery is kept in a certain state. And in how it gets to that certain state is a product of all the different ways it gets charged, which is primarily regenerative braking and the engine itself. Uh, there's no plug in here. You do not plug this vehicle in at any time. It is a true, what I like to call a true hybrid, in that it's completely autonomous from any electrical input as far as exterior electrical input. All your electricity and all your electrons are flying around on board itself, generated by itself. So, anyway, and uh, so. Here's our eco mode if you're not using the engine very much at all and you're mostly look, uh, using the electric motors. And then when you get up into the power phase, that is usually mostly the internal combustion engine, but none of that really matters. It does it very seamlessly and very uh, smoothly. And again, this, uh, the Crown comes only with all-wheel drive, which is great because the all-wheel drive system contributes in many, many different ways. It's not just there in case things get slippery, although it's really good to have if that happens, but it's also there for uh, all kinds of reasons, but handling and uh, just generally, the, like, there's all kinds of functions. Whenever you hit the brakes, you get uh, regeneration to the battery, but it's not just the front motor that uh, contributes and switches over to be an generator. It's the rear one as well. And that uh, pumps up your battery and keeps your battery in a perfect state so that you have the maximum amount of time you can spend on all electric operation, thus saving fuel, saving the environment, and on and on. Uh, the right side we have a uh, typical uh, speedometer and we do have of course some, some variety here. That Now here's, here's where it gets confusing for me. And this is the thing I have with the modern Toyota way of doing things, is uh, you hit the OK button, and this will change the basic configuration to uh, you have a digital speedometer at the top and then just drive information and your average miles per gallon on the left. Uh, but then you go back to this. Those are the two choices there. Now, if we go up and down, we, uh, we have settings. So if you hold the OK button down, then you get the opportunity to change some settings and you can go over to this side here and those are the different, like if you want trip A over here, there you go. You want the uh, charging status of the battery along with what's going on in terms of what's contributing to what, you can put that over there. Uh, and then if we go to this one, oh, there we go, sorry. There's our true settings. You have to keep hitting the, uh, there we go. Uh, here's our various variety of things, like for example, the lane departure uh, enunciation. <laughs> Actually, that's lane departure assist, which I really don't like uh, because the steering starts to take over and it never takes over completely. You can always phys uh, physically override it, but I don't like it. I don't like fighting. And it's not like I'm, when I say fighting, you're not really fighting the steering, but the steering is resisting what you may want it to do. And I really don't like that. So I turn that off. And, uh, but then we have the blind spot monitoring, which is the greatest, one of the greatest innovations that's come along cars in a long time because it's watching your blind spot for you and warning. You always want to leave that on. I'm telling you right now. And then we have the, uh, uh, this is the distance in which uh, it, warns you when you're about to have a collision. The C stands for collision. Uh, and this is to adjust that distance, for example. If I can do this here, uh, I'm trying to do this. Uh, it's not letting me. Why aren't you letting me? Yeah, I guess you gotta hold it down. There we go. There's the warning timing and you can actually turn it on and off, which is always a nice feature. Uh, 
then we have the uh, personal data assistant. No, that's not it. What is that? This is the, uh, what do they call this? Predictive driving assistant, IS. This is one I really hate. But this is a, there's different units of it involved in, as far as the sensitivity of, first of all, you can adjust the sensitivity of the whole system. But then you have all these different variables right in here that uh, I'll let you read about that when you get the car. <laughs> but, but this is all this predictive stuff that I am not really very fond of at all. Uh, I didn't even realize, I will say one thing about it. Um, I didn't think it was actually, oh, it's turned off, no wonder. Yeah, it hasn't been doing anything because I turned it off the moment I got the car. Uh, I really don't like any predictive stuff because I don't think it's where it needs to be to be uh, sufficiently good at predicting things. <laughs> That's just my opinion. But see, we got your rear cross traffic alert, your uh, rear something dumping, the peaky pass baby, the C. <laughs> the C I know for, for is uh, uh, that's when you open your door and a car's about to hit you. It will warn you about that. And that's turned on on this vehicle. And incidentally, there was a, um, on the new Prius, which I reviewed recently, there was a, this weird thing on the bottom of the door that I was told by a Toyota press person, as far as they knew, that was part of this system, the system that uh, is a warning to tell you not to get out of the car when uh, there's a car coming and about to hit you in the door. Uh, and, and But that it turns out that's not the case on this car at all. That particular structure that was weird that uh, worked with the lower part of the doorway, this car doesn't have that and yet it does have the system itself so hell I don't know uh, and what else we have additional vehicle settings we have oh let's go there what are our vehicles that brake suggestion oh I didn't realize that was on well we'll turn that off uh, DRCC what the heck is that uh, oh that has something to do with your cruise control <laughs> I don't know what it does uh, TP, that's a, a toilet paper warning system. If you're getting low on toilet paper, it, oh, never mind. Uh, scheduled maintenance. Oh, wow. You can reset your schedule. That's very, very convenient if you do your own oil changes, as some of us do. So, anyway, that's, that's that. That's uh, your settings. And uh, you can adjust, like I said, either side of this cluster a little bit. You have a, a little bit of... Uh, room on that. Matter of fact, over here I want to go back to, uh, I want to go back to the island where the ship boats are tied up to the piling. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay, here's where I'm looking. Oh, there's our, uh, this also, uh, a very fun one. This one tells you what the front and rear wheels are doing. Matter of fact, I'm gonna leave that on and drive the car like that for a while, just watch it. Because I have this theory that it, it's very similar to the uh, Lexus RX 500H uh, direct drive, direct four drive or whatever it is. And then it uses uh, all four wheels a lot more. Usually they, uh, in the past, these all wheel drive systems are primarily front wheel drive until they, uh, encounter some slippage in the front wheels and then it activates the rear wheel drive. This vehicle uses the rear wheels a lot, uh, depending on circumstances, especially when you're initially taking off from a dead stop, especially if you're, if you're taking off from a dead spot, a dead stop with a lot of acceleration. Uh, and a lot of that will be biased with the rear because the car is more stable that way and it accelerates better that way. So. Uh, there, it, it's like taking all-wheel drive and, and starting to use it as it, optimize it to the point that it's showing all the different things why it's good to have that, not just because it does so well in inclement weather. So, anyhow, that is that. And when we move over to our uh, our main touch screen display, and it's a beautiful uh, horizontal format, also known as your landscape. It's very clear. I do not like this particular graphic on the uh, energy flow just because it's, it's uh, I just don't, I don't know what they're thinking. One thing I have done with this, and uh, I have to do this with all 
more and more vehicles that I that I review is I have to change it to nighttime because I find it. Uh, oh, I have to enable the audio. Don't. We'll go there, and we'll, then we'll go back to uh, let's see. I'll go to climate just for fun. Uh, I can read it so much easier when it's a uh, black background with a uh, lighter uh, actual script on it because the, the white screens are too white to me. For some reason, I find them much harder to, uh, let, let me do this real quick. I will turn that down like that and then we'll go here. There, we got a little more color. This is much easier to see. And fortunately, I'm so glad the manufacturers still let you pick from uh, what the heck you're doing? Like here's the FM radio side. Oh my God, the static! Stop the static! Uh, it, it it's it's a personal choice, and I've I've tried to get along with the new white screen that people have. I would really show. I'm, I'm avoiding showing you the navigation because this doesn't have it. What does it have? It has our navigation has been rebuilt from the ground up. Tap button below to subscribe. You have to subscribe to the navigation system. Bad move, Toyota. That's not going to... I predict. I will make a prediction for you. Yeah, I have to have the service activated, and then I have to pay the money every month. And that's crazy, guys. Don't do that. That's, that's, Toyota is one of the few that's doing that right now, and I think that's a major league bad move. I don't know how else you can... Uh, unless there's some kind of uh, different navigate. Well, what happens if we do that? Like, I want to look for a place... Search navigation. Uh, Mohegan Sun Casino. I didn't understand. Please try again using a louder speaking volume. Mohegan Sun Casino. I didn't understand. Please well, there you, there you go. I didn't understand you either. See, there's things I need to work on here. Uh, I, I think that they need to fix this navigation snafu. I like personally, one of the, the manufacturers are largely thinking you're just going to use Apple Play or Android Auto anyway and just run it through your phone. Uh, some of us don't like to do that. Some of us like having a good onboard navigation system. <coughs> Excuse me, that's part of the automobile itself. So in the event we don't have our phone with us or in the event we don't want to just deal with the phone, just want to use a navigation system on the car, I think we should be able to do that. And it should be cheaper than ever before for the manufacturers to supply that because of just the ready availability of data and everything else. It's, I don't know what they're thinking. They're just looking for another way to, to, to get people to subscribe to things. And I'm not one of them that lacks that. So anyway, but the screen's pretty. Uh, and I imagine the maps are lovely, but... I don't have a subscription on this, and they don't, you would think maybe they would supply with the uh, press loaners, they would actually have a subscription enabled so you could see all the navigation systems works, but no, they, they may have had like, I bet it has a 30 day free trial or something like that. Anyway, lowering down, we now see our uh, climate control situation, and as is becoming p common practice, you have both heating and ventilation. In an automatic setting that you can set up your various, uh, your front seat zones to maximize your personal comfort. And we drop down here and we have a uh, QI charger that hates my, uh, my case and my phone together because it can't, it won't charge my phone at all in this particular situation, which is disappointing because I always have my phone in a case because, well, I have uh, a... I have a rugged lifestyle. I, I do things that entail, entail dirt and various physical traumas, uh, so I have to have my phone in the case at all times. But heck, here's our button for our visuals on our cameras. And this particular one, it, there's so much neat stuff here. There's, a, there's the old 360, which we're spinning around. It's not the right color. You know, that bothers me so much. And this is our, uh, our 360. And see, the car is actually a ghost-like apparition. And the camera going around here, can you just stop it? Yep. Neat, huh?
there we go. But anyway, you can really study the area around you. Very, very handy. Uh, what else do we have here? What's down here? What does this do? Parking, yeah, it's all, it's a view under vehicle. That's what they call cornering view, body. We, we've got everything, man. It's a, it's a very good camera system and it's easily accessible just with this switch, right? Cheer. And we come down to our shifter and it is a mechano electronic device in that it, you move it mechanically, but it's all electronic. Uh, which is becoming very common. Below that, we have our drive mode selector, and our drive modes are da, 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 normal, sport, in red, always red, and eco will be green. I guarantee it. There you go. Well, it's kind of a teal, actually. But those are your driver settings. You don't have any kind of a, obviously, an off-road setting. This is not an off-road car. However, it does very good on the unimproved roads that I've been on with this car. It does real well. <clears throat> Here's where you can deactivate your traction controls should you so need to do so right there. And then we have our uh, EV mode, one of my favorite buttons, also known as the drive-in mode. Uh, so you can, if the battery is sufficiently charged, you can motor along just on electric, electric power. And that's extremely good in stop and go situations like in the drive through So I love that. Coming up here, we have our, our dual cup holder situation. And we also have two uh, USB-C ports. And then we come back here and we have a console. How deep is it? Very deep. Actually, there's a lot of room in here. Got this little tray that you can configure. We also have what appears to be a USB-A port inside there. Now, as we examine our seating, uh, which I believe is uh, some kind of text, I don't know what I did. What did I do? What did I do with that thing? I'm going to see if I can find that thing there. It's a, I didn't put it in there. Somewhere there's a Moroni in this car that I've misplaced. You reach around here and it's not there. What the heck did I do with it? Well, anyway, <clears throat> I'm going to go out on a limb and say that's not leather. That is probably a synthetic leather that is Toyota really loves. It's probably one of the text units. You'll read at the bottom right down here. It'll tell you what exactly it is. But the important thing is it offers excellent support, good side bolsters, and it's perforated so that that's one of the things that facilitates the ventilation, which believe me, with the hot weather we've been having, that is very, very welcome. Also very welcome is this panoramic roof which uh, does not open. This, this part of the roof does not open like a normal moon roof does, but it does have a power shade, which is really cool. Let me, let me share that with you. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm finding it. Hang on. That's not it. That's not it. I've done this before. Why can't I find it? Shall you join me? There's the lighting with the door and that. There it is. Sorry. There we go. And here she comes. Wow. Nice and fat. Now you have the intimacy of the closed panoramic view. Now we'll open her back up again. Whee! Adds a sense of airiness to the car and does not, in any way that I can tell, in, uh, seem to increase the noise level in the interior, which some of these things do. So what else we got control wise? Well, as is common practice, we have a completely loaded steering wheel with all manner of switch gear. Uh, you have two different kinds of cruise control. You have your cruise control that includes lane tracing. Uh -huh. And then you have regular adaptive cruise control. And I think there may be a setting for non-adaptive cruise control if you're into that. I don't know why you would be because adaptive cruise control is a beautiful thing. It, regulates your following distance, which is one of the most important aspects of cruise control these days, because you don't want to go smashing into people in front of you. Uh, but then this is what we were using earlier to navigate around our screenage, as you can see. Uh, what else? What the hell is this right here? It looks like a speaker. Yeah, this is where your volume control is for your uh, excellent sound system, which I believe I'm willing to bet is JBL because they have such a, let's have a look. No, it doesn't say right there. Probably JBL. They have a wonderful relationship with Toyota and they've produced great products. Oh, there we go. 
Great big help. Yep. Mm-hmm. I knew it. I knew they were working together. Uh, here we have one of my favorite wintertime features. This is your lower de-icing uh, elements in the base of the uh, front windshield in order to help uh, loosen up the ice that tends to congregate around your windshield wipers so that you can get them out and go on your way in, if you're covered with snow and ice, which can happen for a while longer until everything is too hot. Uh, here we have our automatic headlight dimming uh, feature, which you can turn on and off with this switch. Very simple, very straightforward, and I'm still not totally sold on the uh, automatic systems just because there's still a lot of stuff that can easily trick it, and that's not good. Here we have your button for your uh, trunk lid, and here we have your gas access. Gas access <coughs> is different on hybrids. It doesn't just have a flap you can open all the time. You have to press that because due to emissions, there are, there's a limited amount of time you can access it. And it's, it can be kind of complicated. Just don't press the button until you're getting gas. That's all, that's all you have to remember. It's not going to cause any major problems for you or inconveniences, but it's just the way it is. It's, that's all part of the uh, emissions control system. So there you go. So. Uh, that is our front seat. We have also, we have de uh, plenty of room, plenty of headroom, not as much as on your modern SUVs because this is actually, after all, a sedan. But I find the uh, riding, driving position to be very, very comfortable. And uh, it's got a lot of adaptation. You can go way up and way down, back, forth. You know all the things that you can do with uh, power assisted seating. Extremely good. So now, how about that rear seat, shall we? Let's. All right. De, 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 de. Our, our engine's actually running. Wow. We beat you. Oh, no, it's not. It's not the car. That's next door. <laughs> yeah, they're doing some yard work. <clears throat> A nice, generous opening to the rear seat. Not like uh, Avalon size, but roughly, I would say, Camry sized. People are going to do a lot of comparison of this car to the Camry, but from a driving personality standpoint, there are real different cars. All right, look at all the room we have here. Excellent leg room. Uh, you have a mild drive shaft tunnel, which doesn't have a drive shaft in it, but it does have a lot of cables running through it to the lower, to the rear uh, propulsion system. You're sitting on top of the battery, which is a nickel metal hydride, which I'd rather sit on instead of a lithium ion personally, because well, you know, those things can get kind of hot sometimes. Um, we have a very easy to access and very state-of-the-art LED type map lights, which you got to know where you're going with your maps. Uh, we have here <gasps> heated seats, heated rear seats. That's becoming more common. The windows go down 99%, which is great. <clears throat> You also have, uh, for each of your rear passengers, provided you have two rear passengers, they each get their own USB-C port so they can plug in their various devices. Now, you know, I'm always talking about something else, and this is, this is to put the, the lie to that. You have a little uh, pouch back here for your uh, tablet, your magazines, your book, whatever, but there's one on the, uh, behind the driver, too. Now, usually this one doesn't have a thing here. It doesn't have this little pocket, but this one has it on both sides. Isn't that interesting? Why is it on this car and not on, not on others? I do not know, but I do find that fascinating. And here we have our armrest, which is all oh, that's, now see, that is a perfect height. Now, there's so many of them, they're like up here and they're kind of awkward. This one's just right. That's exactly where the arm rests. Your, your arm kind of naturally falls here, at least if you're me. Um, we have two cup holders. And do we have a, a ski through? No, we do not have a ski through, but instead we do have, and uh, it's accessed in the trunk. There's a little, uh, not a button, but a little lever type pull thing <laughs> on both sides for lowering your 60-40 seat for access to the rear of the cabin to increase your cargo area, which is all the rage and has been for 20 years. So, 
There's our panorama for our uh, rear seat passengers to enjoy it. And uh, it's just a, there's just, this car just doesn't really have any vices to it. And I mean, that's, that's a big deal to me because a lot of people don't think that the, the Crown is different enough from other Toyota offerings to even exist. And they don't know this car. I mean, it has a really, really good hybrid system to it. It has really good all-wheel drive system. It's very comfortable, and it has everything you need, nothing you don't kind of situation. I also like the fact that I think the uh, interior decor is quite nice. It's, it's the workmanship and everything else on the car is terrific. It feels like a nice, solid piece, like you're getting something. So then they, they, people say, well, what about just get a Lexus? Now, I prefer this in a lot of ways to a lot of Lexus offerings because it is, of all the reasons I've been mentioning, it's much more straightforward and conventional without being boring. I mean, it's, uh, it's a good car. I think the thing I don't understand, and I mentioned this elsewhere in this video, is I don't know why uh, Toyota doesn't promote this more, to be honest with you, because it's such a nice car. It's got a lot going for it. So there you go. Let us move onward now. We have to take this thing out for a drive, I think. That's what we need to be doing. You know, one of the things I've noticed right off the bat with the Crown is that it seems to be using uh, the electric motor a lot. It's, it seems like, even though the mileage isn't, the overall mileage here is not stellar, although I think I'm getting better than the total average, it, uh, it seems to be on full electric a lot more, and, and even at higher speeds than I'm used to seeing in most Toyota hybrids and I like that because it, it's good for a lot of different reasons but it's such a beautifully integrated power plant and something else that's interesting is I, I just uh, matter of fact it has been posted <laughs> I just posted it the, the chronology of when cars actually come out on this uh, on this uh, tube of you and when I actually test them, there's a lot of times there's a, a fair disparity between that just because of logistics. And I just posted the uh, Lexus RX 500H, and it has a real interesting, a very similar system to this, but very different in that the gasoline power plant is different. It has a turbocharged engine. And this one is not turbocharged, but it is very, very uh, smooth. And it's, I'd say it's a rival with the smoothness of that engine, except this doesn't have all the mocky mock of turbocharging. And it gets, I can already tell you, probably gets about 10 miles per gallon better on average. As you can see, we just had an inclemency. We had a downpour. We had severe thunderstorm warnings, and flash flood warnings. And I think they've passed for the moment. Will there be a rainbow? Possibly, possibly. It has been known to happen under these conditions. Oh, there's an interesting sound from the engine compartment. It's just kind of a growl. Of course, this engine is not completely warmed up yet. What is our temperature? Do we have our temperature readily at hand? Yes. No, it's, it's, it looks like it is warmed up. I've said this before, uh, especially with hybrids, is there is a lot of work that goes into uh, warming up the engine as fast as possible. Now, this is as loud as the engine's going to get because we're going uphill under load with a heavy dependency on it. And uh, we're going to go to our uh, cruising. Adaptive cruise mode is has been established. Push to activate. No, I don't want to activate the driving support system. I just want to go. Well, see owners. Yeah, see this. I've had this. Pro what are they, the new Prius? I had a problem with. 
you have to figure out which one of these adaptive cruise control but I don't want the steering assist can I do that yeah there we go you have a lot of choices on you do you remember when cruise control used to be cruise control <laughs> All it did, well, it was essentially the same as like putting a stick or a brick on the accelerator pedal, and that was it. And you you went at, uh, you set it at a speed, and it, the car would kind of keep that speed for the most part. Not always. It would get its own moods. But now we have, we not only have the, one of the greatest improvements to cruise, cruise control, I think, has happened in the recent development in the current times of electronic cruise uh, evolution, let me call it, is the adaptive function, whereas it will uh, regulate the speed of, that you're following, or the distance, rather, you're following from the victim in front, a victim. <laughs> I meant to say vehicle. Uh, I said victim. That's funny. Uh, this adaptive cruise control is excellent so far. I'm very pleased with it. Uh, but it, uh, but that was a big, a big breakthrough when you could start regulating the, the driving distance. Now, what we have is a, uh, a system where the, it, the car will steer itself should you desire. I usually steer away from that. You see what I did there? Uh, because I just don't like it. I don't like the steering wheel moving on its own. I never have. Uh, and I do like pretty much more than anything else the feel. This is right up there with the. Uh, I've had a lot of good cars lately, uh, and I'll, I'll give you an example. This is. I don't mean to be mean to the uh, Kia Seltos because I got one of those right now, also. But you can really tell the difference between these two vehicles now. Sometimes you'd be surprised. An economy a vehicle, a compact like the Seltos, uh, can surprise you with, first of all, in typical Kia fashion, it has lots of features on it. It is not lacking in features by any stretch of the imagination. It's really pretty fantastic that way. But there's certain things where in order for it to be a more affordable vehicle, they've got to cut, they're not really cut corners, but they, let's just say they cut costs. And they do that by uh, using, for instance, plastics that are a little more plasticky. And just the whole feel of the car is, it feels more like an economy car. And I don't, I'm, believe me, I'm not dissing the Kia Seltos in the least by saying that. But what I am saying is this is not an economy car. The Crown is expensive and it feels expensive. It feels really, really solid, really refined. It almost has a... a quality to it like it's uh, almost like a hand-built type of quality that you usually get in Lexus vehicles but this is different that's the fun part about this I actually like this more than most Lexus sedans because it has a certain normality to it that uh, it's hard to explain but like the instruments and everything else are much more are much plainer and normal uh, Lexus tends to go over the top, in my opinion, with things like track pads that you run. And I find that all that stuff to be just distracting. I'm not a big fan of that. The dynamics of the car and the mechanical nature of the cars are fantastic. I mean, they drive beautifully, very quick, handle great, great brakes and all that stuff. But so does this. This has all these attributes. Attributes. So... And with, with hybrids, you're almost always going to be sitting at the light with the engine off. But what is really interesting about them, and I noticed this, uh, what was I driving very recently? Oh, I was driving a car that was just a, uh, I believe it was a Genesis, very upscale. But it had a engine stop-start feature, and it was very hot outside. And while we were sitting in a light, the engine was off. So the air conditioning system does not, in my opinion, work as well. And it was starting to get kind of, you could just tell, it was, get, it, was, it was starting to heat up here in the cabin a little bit. Whereas the air conditioning on this car is doing the same, it's just as cold as it was with the engine running. I mean, they've, uh, again, I'm huge, you know, am I biased in an area? Yeah, I'm biased towards hybrids because I, I really think they're the best thing for most people at this point in history. Next to trains. Nothing's better than a train. But... Uh, 
in terms of overall, I mean, if you're in a situation where you can make an electric work, you have charging stations and stuff like that, go for it, man. They're great. They're really great. They make, they make uh, internal combustion engines in general seem like dinosaurs, and they require a lot less maintenance, yada, yada, yada. But I'm telling you, the, the fact that you have to get it charged and how long it, it takes to charge it, no matter what it is, uh, you got to factor that in. And if you're in a situation where that's not a problem, you're in good shape. But a lot of people are in a situation where that would be a huge problem because they need to be able to gas it and go. And that's the beauty of the hybrid is you can just put gas in it and this thing has, uh, I don't have the range up, do I? Ah, so many things. Trip time, there we go, I'm sorry. It's right there with the gas gauge. I, have, I still have, uh, I've gone, uh, let's see, 65 miles and it's saying I still have 459 miles left of range before I have to put fuel in the tank. Think about that, that's fantastic. And how long does it take to put fuel in the tank? Uh, about three minutes. And they're, you know, interesting thing with uh, hydrogen electrics, they've gotten, the, gotten that down to when uh, you have to fill it up with hydrogen, which is roughly the same time as you have to put gas in a gasoline car. Uh, they're getting that fill time down quite a bit to about, uh, I believe it's about five minutes now. But then there's crazy stuff. I thought hydrogen internal combustion engines were like, no, that's not going to happen. But I just saw a, 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 a you, YouTube video, a tube of you, with uh, the brilliant writer, uh, actor, comedian, Rowan Atkinson, uh, driving a little Yaris that had an internal combustion engine that was powered by hydrogen, a rally car. And he was zooming along and talking about it. He's such a great guy, and he's freaking, he knows his stuff. He's a very enthusiastic uh, rally driver. And, and uh, so I didn't even know that was what was going on, but that's interesting because I'd like to know more about that as far as, is that actually feasible? The, the, the thing about whenever you hear hydrogen, there are, a lot of people think, <laughs> think of different things. Some people think of the Hindenburg, but other per people think about the fact that it's the most abundant element in the universe. And there's energy to be had there. Number one, it's number one on your periodic table, I believe, unless they moved it around. But it's a fantastic thing. And here's what I love most about my EV button. I'm gonna pull in here to this drive through there, and I'm gonna put, hit my EV button, and we're all electric now. I do have a pick to knit. Uh, with Toyota in general, with their uh, QI chargers, for some reason, uh, most of the vehicles I test, I have a, I have a iPhone. Uh, what is this? It's a, it's a special. It's a very, it's a, it's a VSE. It's a very special edition. <laughs> and I put it into the charger, and uh, it, it has a case on it. That is, of course, your uh, OtterBox Defender. Very famous case. Highly recommended by me if you're a person that's throwing your stuff around all the time. And it just, in this car in particular, it has a very good system of holding it down, sort of, but it doesn't work. I mean, it will not charge this. And I got a, I got this thing here. I don't know what, oh, there it is. And I don't know if that's the help. It's a little insert. It may be, it may be something with this, Somebody, oh, there we go. Maybe that helps. Uh, no. But uh, on most of the other cars I drive, that's not an issue. But on every Toyota I've had, it'll charge it sometimes, and then other times it won't, or that kind of thing. And I find that cumbersome. I would prefer if it actually... Uh, charge when I put it in there because and that can be necessary sometimes that's net number one net number two is the navigation system because if you want here we go to navigation what do you have to have you have to subscribe to a navigation system and I ain't doing that because that's well, not my car <laughs> but on my other vehicles that have a navigation system which is two of them uh, they have their own navigation system. You don't have to subscribe anything. I do on one of them because I, 
I like to get up to the minute traffic information, but there you go. Well, so a lot of people say you really shouldn't look at the underside of a crown because there'll be, you know, a little sweatband and hair and all that kind of thing. But no, I encourage you to do so because it's really quite fascinating. Fully independent is the suspension, and it does have uh, upper and lower control arms. In terms of the bottom one is primarily, largely serves as a cup for our beautiful uh, coil spring. Outbound, we have uh, a standard shock absorber of excellent quality, by the way. And uh, we got your uh, stabilizing unit here. And up front here, what do we have? Yep, we got a strut in front. A strut in back, and uh, how many links does that make all told? One, two, three, four. I'm sure it's probably a five link system. And uh, snaked all the way through there, you can probably see the rear drive shaft to the rear wheel. Now, this is on the uh, passenger side here. Now, we go over here, and beneath this protection area, it looks amazingly like a uh, uh, RAV4 hybrid, to tell you the truth. But that is our motor number two underneath here that powers the rear wheels when necessary. But as usual, with the Toyota hybrid all-wheel drive systems, there is no physical connection between the rear wheels and the front wheels in your all-wheel drive situation, which is good because that's the way we're going now. And it's actually, from a packaging standpoint, it's a whole lot easier for the manufacturers. So that way you don't have a huge drive shaft tunnel or anything through the rear of the car especially if you have a car as opposed to a body-on-frame SUV, which it's not as critical there because usually the body is mounted higher anyway. But this way, the body is going to continue its low mount so you have a lower center, center of gravity. And the uh, hybrid battery is, of course, underneath the, left se uh, the uh, rear seat with that ventilation unit on the driver's side instead of the passenger side, which is different. And as you can see, it's a solid construction underneath here. Uh, you've got a fair amount of protection. Everything's got some kind of shield on it, primarily for aerodynamics as much as any protection, because this is not an off-road vehicle. Although, as you can tell, it has a, a fair amount of ground clearance on it, and uh, it's fairly well protected as well. But overall, the, uh, this very thing, this very substantial uh, subframe is just bolted into the uh, unibody of the car and so it helps to isolate any of these nasty bumps you may receive. Now the top of the springs as you can see rest on a structure that is part of the unibody so it's not completely isolated but it, and yet and yet the uh, overall quality of the ride is excellent. Uh, it also has a lot of uh, travel to it. As you can see this uh, this tire right here, this and here, is not near uh, off the ground or anything else. It's actually, even though it is uh, sticking out quite a bit as far as you got your extension here and your compression over here, uh, it's still fairly planted onto the ground. So that's great for overall handling as well, especially over bumpy corners and things like that. So there you go. This is underneath the crown. And it, like the whole rest of the car, it has excellent build quality. And uh, there's a reason it's kind of the top of the line Toyota cars, because they, uh, they spared no expense. Although it, well, that's, no wait, that's Lexus when they totally spared no expense. This one, they just paid more for everything. Put better components on there. There you go. I don't miss the Avalon a lot, uh, at all, actually, when I, when I look under this car, because this car is a lot more what I would describe as athletic compared to the Avalon. All right? All right. This is your 2023 Toyota Crown Limited Monroney. And uh, the base price of this vehicle is $45,550. And with the option of advanced technology package, which includes those 21 inch wheels and a few electronic dibs and drabs and things like that, uh, we come to a grand total of $50,020. So what do I think about this car? Well, I quite like it. 
I tell you, if you're in the market for a, a mid-size to large sedan, you can't go wrong with this. It has all-wheel drive. It has an excellent hybrid uh, power plant, which I got right around 40 miles per gallon in a week of mixed driving. It has a very, very nice solid feel to it, an excellent Toyota slash Lexus <laughs> build quality. So uh, you can't go wrong with a car like this if you're in the market for a sedan. I really believe it's one of the nicest cars Toyota's come out with in a while and that's saying something so i'll say one other thing you take care of yourselves out there and uh hopefully god willing we'll see each other next time ja,